So hi, everyone. I'm Anders Kronstedt. Thank you so much for joining this session this morning. Uh, I'm uh, uh, local here in, from born and raised in Orlando, and I've been working on my Swedish accent for the last several <laughs> years. Uh, I think I got it down now. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm president of the Kronstedt Group. Uh, we're a boutique-sized de uh, custom development uh, shop. We've been in business for over 20 years. Uh, and we're working with clients that we, I'm going to share with you some examples here of work for uh, Walmart, which is actually a, a game that's the uh, first time we're doing a game that's actually publicly available. So if you can get the Wi-Fi to work, feel free to download it. It's called Spark City, and we'll be talking about it later on today. Uh, and we'll be talking about virtual reality. I'm going to be sharing an example here on the, uh, the screen, doing a demo of uh, something we developed for a f uh, leading pharma company. So, but let me uh, start with a little trailer to set up uh, what we're going to be talking about here. So, you all remember that, right? Uh, the movie and uh, the, the actual event. So uh, I think this is a good setup for what we're going to be talking about here. Uh, so how did Captain Sully learn to land a plane uh, on the Hudson? Of course, it was through a flight simulator, right? And not just once, but pilots go into flight simulators uh, over and over uh, to uh, practice their skills. And uh, that's really, I think, what virtual reality and what gamification is all about. It is the flight simulator of just about any skill. It allows you to develop mastery of skills by practicing things uh, over and over. Uh, interestingly though, uh, I think there's another good lesson from the, uh, the Hudson River uh, incident, which is uh, these poor people, the passengers. So you all flown a plane, right? And you've seen all these uh, training videos. Uh, what is the one thing you're supposed to bring with you in the rare event of a water landing? that these people didn't remember life to bring. Rest. Life rest. So do you see any life rest on that uh, wing there? So it turns out, after all of the videos that we've heard of, about bringing your life rest, that out of 150 passengers, only 33 of them even thought to bring the life rest, and only four of them put them on uh, properly. <laughs> what an absolute fiasco, right? And so. Uh, this, I think, is the ultimate testimony uh, of, uh, of poor learning, right? It's micro-learning. It's right when we're taking off. Uh, and it's, the videos are usually creative and nicely professionally done. But we just don't learn what we're told to learn. We have to actually practice it to, to, to do it well. So, uh, so we have a case study here of, uh, uh, of two different approaches. The flight simulator approach for the pilot. Uh, which had a 100% success rate, and the safety video, which had less than a 3% success rate, right? And uh, I think this is a perfect metaphor for how training in our corporations and elsewhere uh, in, in, in schools really work. Uh, it might not be quite as dire as 3%, but in fact, there was a Harvard Business Review article this spring that said that uh, barely 10% of the tw $200 billion spent on corporate training in the US actually delivers results. And, uh, and that's because we, we've been segregating uh, training from work, right? We, information is delivered out of context in glossy videos and e-learning, and it's become a time waster instead of a change management tool. And in fact, uh, if you want uh, these slides, uh, I'm going to be passing around the bucket. We're also going to be doing a drawing for the Oculus um, and Go here at the end. I wanted to bring, uh, do a drawing for the Quest, but it's actually sold out, so we have to sell where they go. So feel free to drop a business card. I'll, I'll uh, pass that around. So, um, so this is what we're going to be, be talking about, is how we can use virtual reality and gaming to, to address this. Uh, and I think it's important to remind ourselves about just how bad traditional 
training really is. So we saw the ten the the, uh, the data there about uh, only ten percent being effective. In some areas, like diversity and inclusion training, it's even uh, it's even worse. Uh, there was another Harvard Business Review study last year that suggested that out of the eight billion spent on diversity and inclusion training, uh, that it's at best has no impact, at worst actually has a negative impact on training. So, uh, so when people ask about what's the ROI on these new approaches, I always uh, turn around and ask, well, what's the ROI on the exist on the legacy training? Um, and meanwhile, we know, of course, that uh, for diversity and inclusion training, for instance, that putting yourself uh, into the skin of an African-American avatar re uh, reduces implicit bias. There's been research for over 15 years on this. Uh, this is my favorite study. Uh, virtually being Einstein makes, makes you less, uh, uh, both smarter and less age biased. They've actually done intelligence tests on people before and after, and this carries over even after you, uh, you've been in VR. And even uh, empathy, you can even develop empathy with, uh, with uh, animals. Uh, they put uh, done experiments at Stanford where you're a cow and you whisk away to a slaughterhouse and uh, people don't eat meat for, uh, for weeks after that experience. <laughs> So, uh, so we have something here in VR that's the ultimate empathy machine, and yet most uh, traditional training has uh, even negative effect. And so we're going to be talking here about virtual reality, and then I'll turn into uh, gaming. Uh, I want to acknowledge, of course, that augmented reality is going to have huge impact on our industry. Uh, I, and the difference, I think, is clear probably to everyone here. VR is sort of lights out. You're in in another world. It's kind of the holodeck, transports you to another world. Augmented reality, you can see through, brings things to you. Uh, and augmented reality, I think, is going to have huge impact on performance support, whereas VR, uh, I would position more as this flight simulator, right? That's something you use to practice before you go out and do your work. The thing is, though, VR is here right now, and some of you had a chance to try this new VR headset that I think it's going to be a real breakthrough that's mobile and it has still hand controllers and, uh, and room scale. Uh, it's been here for several years now, the PC tethered one. Whereas AR, if you ever tried any of the headsets, they're still far away from uh, being actually uh, usable. They're big, clunky, and uh, they'll, they'll probably have three or four years to go. So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, why VR is so powerful, and then I'm going to get into a demo here. So it, it is the flight simulator for any scale. It's learning by doing, by putting people into actual performance environment uh, where they can actually practice the skills over and over. And it's embodied cognition. It's using your body. You can actually get up on your feet. And there's actually a lot of research on this uh, idea of embodied cognition. Uh, muscle memory is a real thing. When we get up on our feet while we're learning, we actually commit to memory much better. Uh, and it can maximize reps and sets. We can practice things over and over in a safe environment. And research has shown that repeated movements in v uh, VR causes changes in brain structure, uh, which in turn improve performance in the real world. And the reason for this, the magic uh, sauce of VR is uh, the power of presence is this idea that you can actually go somewhere. Uh, it's a, a, unlike anything else that we've seen in e-learning video uh, that's screen-based, where we essentially take in three-dimensional knowledge and put it on a flat screen. Uh, we're now breaking out of that uh, two-dimensional screen, and we're actually walking into the real world. We don't have to translate something 3D onto a screen and then have the student translate it back in their own brain. We step into the world. This is the ultimate medium, or no medium at all, where you actually are stepping into the, the real world. Uh, it's, it's like going to another place. And so with that as a background, I'm going to do a demo, because when I go to these conferences, I hate when people are just talking about these things but act actually showing what they look like. So uh, and by the way, feel free to want to participate in the drawing, uh, put your card there. Uh, so I'm going to be setting up a, a case here for Novartis. But before I do that, uh, I want to stop and ask if anyone here has, uh, are, are doing VR in their own organization? I know someone here. <laughs> Rich, you're working. Do you want to say what you're? Yeah, sure. So uh, I work for AAA, and uh, Andrew's group here actually put together a VR uh, piece for us for hazard anticipation and hazard recognition uh, for new team drivers, and we're currently field testing it right now. 
any other stuff. Who else is doing VR here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah our company uses it for offshore rig. Oh, wonderful application too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. For yeah. the uh, people to be able to get used to the tools. Right, yeah, right, yeah. Uh, developing a VR game also for uh, health and safety uh, uh, the majors that the, the blue colors can use in Egypt. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, you're going to be interested in the demo I have. It's along those lines. Yeah. Who else is using yeah. VR? Yeah. We use uh, VR to build training around supply chain. Okay. And I think uh, we also dabbled with uh, using VR for new hire induction. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting with the more conceptual. And s things like supply chain, you can like scale things up yeah. and scale things down. Is that what you're doing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So platforms like Unity. Uh, right. Yeah, right, and that's everything I'd kind of show you here is developed in Unity too. Yeah, who else? Uh, we're doing it for unconscious bias. Oh, okay, Great. Uh, wonderful, yeah. So that goes to the, the empathy program that we, we talked about here. What industry is, is that in, if you don't want me asking? Um, I'm with the University of Southern California, okay. and we're using it in our business school. Perfect. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. At Duke, I just introduced them to to using VR and yeah. I made a demo for confined spaces and uh, oh, okay. proposals for high right. uh, risk, uh, low incidence uh, yeah. events like spill response. Okay, like great. Yeah, yeah. Things like heights and confined spaces. There's research that show that you can actually overcome fear of uh, of that by being in a VR environment. So um, a little bit about uh, the, the demo I'm going to show you here uh, is actually developed both for PC tethered and I'm going to be showing it for you in PC Tethered, but it also works, and some of you had a chance to try it on the Quest. Now, I want to make a pitch for, for the Quest. We've been developing, we got an early developer version of it in January, and it's just an incredible device. Uh, it's uh, the first mobile device that allows you to walk around room scale and actually see your own hands. Uh, and it has, some of you had a chance to try it here, and I'll be around the conference today if you want to uh, catch me and, and try it yourself. It has pass-through cameras, so when you put it on, you can actually see the world around you, so it's kind of a makeshift AR, and then you can walk into the, uh, the, the VR space, uh, and uh, it's just $400. Uh, there's a business version that sells for 1000 It's still a great deal, because you don't need one for each student. You still typically only need a few ha headsets anyway. Uh, and I, I think it really reduces the friction. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, hopefully, I, I'm hoping this is the iPhone moment of, of VR, because it also re reduces friction for your decision makers. So I'll really encourage you to get it and bring it to every meeting and just for, put it on the heads of your decision makers. Because, so, you know, VR really has to be experienced and it's so much more accessible but now that you can put it in your handbag or, uh, and just bring it along to a meeting. Um, and uh, just a few things about developing for it though. What we found in moving it from the de desktop version to the mobile is that this is uh, just a, uh, a cell phone processor, actually a, like a few years old Snapdragon processor, so uh, it doesn't ha it has only about tenth, uh, a tenth of the uh, graphic processing uh, power of a, uh, a gaming laptop like, like this. So uh, there's a lot of work that goes into uh, compressing and optimizing things to work well. And if you have something that is really big, uh, say a lot of geo data, for instance, in your VR, uh, environment, it's not going to work on a mobile device. So it only has its constraints, but I, I think for most of your training purposes, it's uh, it's going to be a big breakthrough. You yeah. That's a gaming laptop. Most of us don't have gaming laptops in our. Yeah. Device. See, that's. So what's it like with just a normal everyday laptop? Yeah. So they don't really power VR. Uh, yeah. You know, there's some headsets that. Yeah, you, for, so for P, so there are two, two basic options. If you're going to do real VR with room scale where you can walk around and see your own hands, it's to run it from a PC and you really need uh, like a, a gaming laptop which can be a thousand bucks but can also be two or three thousand bucks. And then you have a cord. There are ways to make it cordless to the PC too. Or, yeah, and th but that's really why this I think is going to be so important is that you, then you don't need the gaming laptop. This is all you need. This is self uh, uh, all inclusive. Some of you had a chance to try it. Do you want to say something about what? Yeah. What, yeah? I think it was, first it was very powerful. Like yeah. Currently see a lot of uh, visual elements. And uh, uh, the elements uh, 
they overlaid the physical body in a very clear manner, mm -hmm. so kind of distinguish between what is virtual and what is mm -hmm. physical. And I could also see the transition when you kind of step out of the room. Yeah, right. So that pass-through camera where you can see, it's hard to explain, but it's, you kind of see it like night vision. It's in black and white. But you see everything around you. Yeah. And then you walk into the VR world. Yeah. You, fe you felt more controlled, <coughs> like, yeah. as if you had some kind of reasonable control in comparison to other devices. Right, like yeah. Cardboard and yeah, right. Yeah. So that was Be right, because you can actually move around and see your own hands. Yeah. Yep. Since I was recently evaluating it for use in training, I also shared that one of the exciting things I like about the Quest is the fine manipulation you can do, like pressing buttons and grabbing things, which you couldn't do with the Go. So right. For us, exactly. It allows for much more, much more fidelity exactly. in simulating things like uh, lockout, tagout, picking up equipment, and pressing buttons and things of that nature. So yep. um, that's another advantage right. that I saw on the Quest. So, so that's a really important distinction. So this is only what's called three degrees of freedom. So you're only standing at one point and uh, turning your head and using kind of laser pointer at interacting with things, kind of like an e-learning. Here you are physically walking around, you're seeing your own hands, you can get down on the floor, you can grab things. Uh, so uh, that, that makes a huge, that, that's what we call real VR. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I'm not comparing this, the Quest one with the, with the, with the Go one. You know, like mm -hmm. I'm comparing the Quest with the, the Rift, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, they are in the same category, but with right. the Go, we're doing like 360 filming and moving around and some other designs. So it's so I, I, don't, I don't feel that this is. Yeah, right. This is two different. So only uh, for 360 video, this is that's really what this is aimed yeah, at. Yeah, yeah. because 360 stuff. video, uh, when you're shooting with a camera, then you're stuck where the camera is anyway. Uh, you don't have that um, the room scale and the ha exactly. so yes. so. Um, yeah, that's. I think that's a really good way to put. This is really a, a 360 video viewer, and this is uh, for v uh, computer generated real VR where you're walking around and grabbing things. Yeah. I just had a question. Mm -hmm. As far as compatibility, are is the Quest iPhone only? Uh, no, I, what, so I, what I was saying is it, it's the equivalent of an iPhone processor, but no, it's completely standalone. Uh, so uh, you don't need, you actually need a phone to set it up in the, in the consumer version, but not the business version. Uh, but once you have it set up, it's like, it's standalone. So um, you don't need a phone for it even. So that one doesn't need power of the game in Exactly. So that's a big, this is all self-contained. You download things, we have, wi this is Wi-Fi enabled, you download it here, but then it's stored locally and you don't even need a Wi-Fi. So I can run it here without the Wi-Fi. So, uh, so with that, let's uh, launch into this demo. So Novartis, you know, one of the large, largest pharma companies in the world, they have essentially came up with a cure for leukemia, for uh, blood cancer for kids. They have like 90% success rates. And it's one of these fancy new treatments where you draw the blood from the patient and harvest it in a lab for 10 weeks and do all kinds of DNA uh, magic and then uh, put it back into the patient. Well, they had to hire hundreds of people to do these uh, lab treatments. And as you can imagine, this is real patient blood. These are patients who are on the last straw. Uh, if they do one screw up, if if they drop something, uh, contaminate it, you have to go back and draw new blood and the kid might be, be dead. So very critical life and death procedures, lots of new people to uh, train. They had one physical lab to do the training in and the physical lab had real blood and stuff. So it's very expensive and was a bottleneck for training. And surely they had to go into the physical lab to um, do the final training, but uh, this VR exercise uh, really replicated that and was in a safe environment where they can train over and over. And I want to show you what a, uh, uh, actually, yeah, if you want to grab a chair here. <laughs> uh, I want to take you inside of this to show you what, uh, what a simulation like this will actually look like. So I'm going to quickly set up this. Um, so uh, we got it running on um, uh, HTC and this is the Microsoft standard so this is uh, uh, PC tethered uh, but uh, uh, yeah. so I'll a quick run setup but. So I'll set up the boundaries here. So this is PC tethered, but it doesn't have the external cameras. It's uh, inside out uh, tracking. And the, uh, the benefit with the PC tethered is to when you're doing big presentations like this, 
is that uh, you can uh, mirror it on a screen like I'm doing here and showcase it. Um, the Quest, in theory, does do mirroring like this, uh, but uh, I don't really recommend it because it's such a small graphic uh, processor uh, and it degrades the experience quite a bit when you're inside of the headset. Oh, sorry for the loud noise here. So you're now going to be seeing what I see in the headset. And uh, I'm not going to be talking to you when I'm in VR. So don't do any pranks on me here. Don't leave the room or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's a skill that uh, I've been practicing here for the last year to, to do this. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, so you can uh, now see what I'm seeing in the lab. I can see my own hands. Uh, and I want to point out a few things. So we, we talked about the difference between three degrees of freedom and six degrees of freedom. And just to drive home that point again, uh, in, uh, uh, in a three degrees of freedom, in the Oculus Go, for instance, you're just looking around like this, but you can't even lean forward. Uh, the, whole, the whole world will lean with you if you lean forward. And you can only like click, uh, you have kind of like a laser pointer like this that you can click on different targets. And you can load up another video, for instance. Uh, but you, uh, you can't walk. So the, here I have room scale. So I can physically walk around here. I can lean forward. I can duck. I can look at things from, uh, from different uh, angles. So that's, that's the difference between three, uh, three degrees of freedom, which is just the different directions of the head tilt, and six degrees, where you can walk forwards, backwards, upwards, uh, and uh, sideways. So. Um, uh, in this world, as you can see, this is so. This is all computer generated. It looks very real. In fact, I get a lot of questions about, well, is this three, uh, 360 video or is this actual computer generated? But it's uh, equipment. Uh, it can be almost uh, photo uh, identical, as you can see here. People is a different things. Uh, if you have characters, you can immediately see, of course, that they're not uh, real people. So, uh, but what I want to show you here is what. What does it take to develop a simulation for someone who doesn't know anything about how a lab works and uh, to uh, make them proficient at a, a certain skill? So I'm going to pull up uh, some uh, uh, classes here. Uh, and uh, let's see, we can do uh, uh, this one here, for instance. Uh, so this, uh, we can literally train anyone here to do a, a skill uh, that some, anyone who's never been in a lab before to, to do a skill. And the way we're doing it here is we have the video that's actually shot in VR. Uh, so you have to wrap your brain around this. So it's shot in VR. It demonstrates exactly what to do. And I have it right in front of me and I have another video there. Uh, the, the videos are all over. And we actually found this idea of having sort of video tutorial inside of VR works really well. So, and it shows step by step what I'm supposed to do here. So I just grab, so I can see my own hands here. I grab this. And uh, I look at the video, I'm supposed to grab it, I'm supposed to hang it uh, on top of this thing there. And da-da, so now I got that right. So now a new video is queued up showing me the next step here, how I'm supposed to grab this thing uh, and hang it uh, next to the first one there. So, uh, and you're going to see here shortly, when I do something wrong, it will detect that and will tell me right away. So now a new video is queued up, I'm supposed to take this bag here, and hang it over there. Uh, and this is just like in real life. I'm uh, grabbing things very naturally. Uh, so uh, I'm supposed to uh, grab, I think the, they tell me to do, grab this bag here and hang it over there. All right, and now I'm supposed to take these two bags and uh, put them over here. And uh, the next step is I'm going to uh, uh, tilt this and a few things here. So here you can show that I, you can like lean down and see things. Now this act, the, the meter here is kind of tiny, so we've blown it up. So those are the kind of considerations you have to do in VR. So you uh, you have the 15% there uh, blown up. So now I'm put, uh, doing it at 15%. Okay, and then it says all clamps closed. I'm supposed to check the, uh, that they're they're all closed. That looks good. And now I'm supposed to uh, take uh, this thing here and open it. Did we see a mistake? 
<laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm, uh, I think I'm going to do that very soon here. <laughs> okay, so that, now I open that. So, so now watch here. So now the blood comes from this bag and it comes over here, right? So it's just like in real life. Um, and I'm supposed to wait um, until that bag is full and then I'm uh, supposed to uh, take this thing again, close it. And I uh, take this clamp here, and, uh, and now the fluid is uh, going somewhere else. And so let's see, uh, see if I can do something. Okay, so now I did the wrong clamp. So immediately it says, uh, so there's a text there, you do not open this uh, clamp. So, uh, so this is like having an instructor watching over my shoulder, catching you as you're doing the mistake. Uh, and uh, then have to uh, redo it. So in this case, we go back and I have to do that uh, last step. Uh, and once the simulation is done uh, step by step this way, you catch you, when you do a mistake, you redo it. Uh, you have to do the whole thing uh, without it stopping you. And then there's a, a feedback mechanism after that. So uh, we had a subject matter expert. His name was Vladi working with us on this. And uh, the joke was that it was like having a virtual Vladi over your shoulder at every moment. And that's, I think, one of the key things with VR. I mean, you could do this in a physical lab. It would be expensive. But could you have an instructor like hovering over your shoulder, watching every single move you do, telling exactly what to do? You could maybe, but that would be very cumbersome. And here you can practice things over and over. I want to point out a few other things. Those, so these are all you know, replicating what you could theoretically do in, in real life. Now, there are things in VR that uh, you can do that you couldn't do in real life. And uh, one of the uh, exercises here is, uh, so I'm going to go to the next, uh, another lesson here, where uh, we're under uh, this hood. So uh, uh, now I'm uh, in this uh, area here. And this is a little hard to see on this screen share. But so uh, this hood has a giant fan that's blowing air. And obviously, you can't, in real life, you can see that air. Well, in VR, we're visualizing this air. So the air is actually blowing here. And if I look closely here, you see that we visualize the airflow. So those are the kind of things, visualizing the invisible uh, that you can uh, do in VR that you couldn't do in real life. And uh, to do this thing, so antiseptic behavior is real key here. So you spray your hand. And you see how the color changes when I do that? Uh, so. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, and and uh, the point here is that, uh, so change color, and then you have to wait a few seconds. If you go straight away, right away here, it's going to tell you that you did it wrong. If you wait too long, uh, it will tell you as well. So you're supposed to wait uh, for a few seconds. And then uh, here, it's super important that you have your hands over uh, over these things, and they cannot touch anything here. And the hands, because of this airflow, the hands have to be angled like this and uh, not held flat. And so uh, there's, there's a warning right away if I'm, and I'm uh, not allowed to uh, cross my hands over each other. And by visualizing the airflow like this, I understand much better why this is. And what you're not seeing here too is that there's actually a vib slight vibration in my hands when I put them in here. And when I sprayed my hands, there was a vibration both on the spray bottle and the hand that was being sprayed. So that's a haptic feedback that helps uh, uh, helps me uh, feel like I'm actually in the environment. So again, I look at the video here, I, I grab something, I'm supposed to uh, take some, uh, this thing here. Oh, I uh, messed up already. So uh, I, I moved my hands too quickly. So you can track exactly how quickly. Now, is that something you could, a manual instructor could know exactly if you moved your hands too quickly? Probably not, but in VR you can track exactly how quick you move your hands if you're uh, crossing your hands like this, it will uh, uh, give you uh, warnings. So uh, one last thing I wanted to uh, point out in this uh, demo is, um, let's turn to uh, this lesson here. So uh, in this lesson, I'm supposed to grab these bags, they're open uh, here, grab these bags. I'm supposed to put this in a, it's a, a welding machine uh, that you put on and you're, uh, and you're welding things. Uh, but one thing I wanted to, uh, to point out here is that uh, this, 
uh, the, uh, so you, you can see the the, uh, the physicality of uh, of the tubes. It's something we had to work real hard on. Is to uh, yeah, I'll turn to you guys <laughs> to oops, <laughs> dropped on the floor. Uh, is to get the <laughs> physicality of the the tubes. Uh, so it really feels like the real thing. Uh, and when you grab it like this, the elasticity of it. Uh, it, this is a crazy thing, is it feels like that's resistant. There's no physical resistance for me. But when I stretch it like this, I really feel, it feels like it gets harder and harder the more I pull it out here. And that's just crazy uh, how the mind fills in the gaps. So you're seeing something that you've done a thousand times in real life. You know that when you're stretching something like this, that it's going to get tighter and tighter. And so the mind tells you, yeah, it's getting tighter and tighter. So to everyone that says, oh, we need haptic feedback for everything we do in VR, because otherwise it's not going to feel real. That's just, a, that's just absolutely nonsense. You don't need to have, certainly something like vibration when you grab something can be just fine. And you don't need to have everything, uh, like you don't need the smell, you don't need the haptic feedback for everything. The mind fills in the gap. It really feels like I'm in this world and it feels like it gets harder and harder the further I uh, stretch this out. So, um, any, what do you guys think? Any thoughts on this? We're still here. Yep, you're still there. <laughs> Thanks for it. <laughs> uh, any Comments, yes? Well, I really liked your in game video. Yeah, I right. I played a lot of VR games. Yeah, and right. I, I was just thinking, geez, you know, there are so many onboarding issues. Right, that yeah. Be prevented very directly, even though so many say, oh, you know, click this button. Click right, you know, yeah. Right, yeah. Entirely, uh, I think, very significant. Yeah, yeah. This was something we, we were on a time crunch and we were thinking, how can we do this? Uh, and we didn't have the body to have like a robot or something or a character actually showing it, which could have been another way. Uh, but yeah, we found that, and this is actually literally someone doing it in, one of our developers doing it in VR and just uh, doing a screen recording and then putting it up on board. Any other, yeah? Can that be done with the Go as well? So uh, with the Go, you only so the stuff that you, we did for you guys, uh, which is the driving experience, uh, you um, you only have that one clicker. So we can certainly uh, turn it into uh, a, a tutorial type of. But the, yeah, the tutorial function we can totally do, yeah. But in that one, you're just uh, you're clicking on dangers, but you don't you're not actually driving. But that it could be certainly turned into a, a, using both hands, yeah. Hmm? For us, those of us who are reviewers, I kind of noticed myself feeling a little, uh, not overwhelmed, but sensitive to such constant. Yes. Movement. Are you working on it? So. That? So right, so the, the nausea is a huge issue in VR. It's actually worse for you guys watching someone else in the headset. It's actually, I find, more nauseating than actually being in the headset. I'm fine, but <laughs> I'm sorry for causing <laughs> nausea for you guys. Which is why I think this type of demo, is, it's obviously I want to give you the idea here, uh, but it's not ideal to be watching other people. Uh, you really have to get in the headset yourself. And I'll say, uh, with a go, that's a bit of a nausea issue, mostly because uh, you don't you don't see your hands, and if you even tilt your head, which we all do, uh, uh, the whole world moves. We we can't like tilt the head inside of the world. So with three degree of freedom, it's a bigger issue. With six degree of freedom, uh, when you're actually in the world, the brain is just completely sold on the concept that you're right there, and uh, we've uh, you have to work hard on eliminating things like uh, automatic rides. Uh, you have to make sure that the user is in control of things. Uh, so there are some tricks to developing the experience in well, well to avoid nausea. But I guess my question yeah. is, as the instructor, if I'm, let's just say I'm watching right. you do this, yeah. and if I, I can't see it because it's making me nauseous, how do you? Yeah, no, that, that is an issue, yeah. One solution is to have a multiplayer environment where the instructor puts on a VR headset too and is in the world. Uh, but yeah, watching on the screen someone else bobbling their head around, that, that can certainly be, be nauseating. <laughs> yeah. Are there, are there any aspects of the training procedure, because it's got, probably got a lot of elements to it that cannot be trained by yeah. this method? Yeah, so that's a great question. So what do you use it for? What do you not use it for? So obviously any type of spatial procedural training where you need to practice things over and over. And you mentioned some great examples, oil rigs, uh, healthcare. Uh, 
and uh, there's also the soft skills of getting inside of the body of another person, seeing what the world is like from that character. Uh, wh where I would say it's not appropriate for is like if it's just like an IT training where it's just screens. Like, look, reading text is not ideal. We do have a fair amount of text here, but we also have the video, and it's we try to keep it very short. It gets very strenuous to read a lot of screens, and certainly if it's a training on just how to use the software. Uh, I would not use VR. It's important, I think, not to use VR frivolously. It's not an all-purpose device. It shouldn't be used for everything. This you know, gives an indent in the forehead. The instructor can get nauseous. You, you need to save this for what's really important, if it's life or death, safety-related or uh, otherwise. Uh, but if you don't absolutely have to do VR, you shouldn't be doing VR. So actually, I have a slide at the end here. but. Um, I think VR should be used for when you can't do it in real life, if it's too expensive, too costly, too inconvenient, or if you want to visualize something that's just not possible to do in real life, then you should use VR. Hmm? I was trying to get an idea of um, the time frame that it would take to develop and deliver something like this, the manpower mm -hmm. and the cost. Yes, so great question. So this actually we had a crazy timeline of uh, three months to get this developed. Um, and uh, we got it up from scratch, and we just had, we didn't have any 3D assets. We had walked into the lab, took a bunch of pictures and, and videos, did some tape measures of things, and then modeled it based on uh, those reference pictures, and then worked with the subject matter experts. Um, so ideally, to do thorough testing, I would recommend four or five months, uh, but it can be done shorter. Uh, but it does require a team of, uh, uh, game developers who are um, have a combination of uh, art skills, 3D art skills to model everything in 3D, and then programmers, and then of course you need instructional designers and game designers to uh, come up with the overall concepts of what you're going to be developing. And as far as cost, this was about uh, 150,000, 200,000 development budgets. So in the high end of e-learning, but not I don't think it's uh, really super expensive. And the thing with the cost is very different cost structure from most traditional learning programs in that once you develop the lab and all the equipment, you, we can now add modules to this. We can make like, uh, we're talking about doing like a five hour long training session in the same lab. And additional modules using the same assets are going to be very inexpensive to develop and quick to, to um, develop. Uh, but it's, it's an initial investment in developing all the uh, the, uh, the assets, and particularly if it's unique things like a lab and particular equipment uh, where you have to um, develop it from scratch that cost a bit. Okay. Hmm? Yeah. What yeah, let's, uh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> what, what skills besides uh, Unity 3D was used to uh, well, so there's uh, my uh, 3D there. There's uh, Autodesk Maya for uh, some of the actual modeling, and then we import it in. But Unity is sort of the the platform that brings everything together. Yeah. Are there some disabilities that can not or can use this with accommodations or? Uh, so disabilities, uh, right? So uh, obviously this. People who have uh, wheelchair bounds, for instance, uh, can uh, move around in this environment. Uh, we actually uh, were at a show a few weeks ago where someone in a wheelchair tried this lab experience and had a great experience in it. Uh, obviously, visual impairment is an issue, uh, but uh, you were used doing it with one, one leg there, uh, one eye, so that's, that actually worked. I don't know, you didn't see it in 3D as well? Or? I mean, I don't see anything in 3D anymore. Yeah, right. <laughs> And I don't know how much I haven't used the Quest before. I yeah, used the right. Vibe quite yeah. a, bit, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, so some of my my spacing was a little yeah, bit off, right. but I don't know if that's me or yeah. just the. But it still you know. worked. Yeah. So, but obviously it's a very visual medium. So, uh, yeah, for visual impaired, it can still be an issue. Yeah. I was just gonna mention if uh, folks wanted to to try out simple simulations for for VR and don't know Unity or Unreal or have a team of engineers, which I wish I had. Uh, when I did my demonstrations for Duke, I used Amazon Sumerian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, them. right. And you can make easy, not not this, but easier, uh, low, low, almost no cost um, uh, activities yeah. that will work in the cost, the cost and the quest on the go. Mm -hmm. And then maybe that we can show your, your, your people what it's like and then get approved. Right, that's yeah, it's a prototyping tool. I think that's, yeah, that, that's a, that's a yeah. very good idea. Yeah, that's called Amazon Sumerian, yeah. Sumerian, you said? Yeah. 
Is that actually a talk by somebody? That's not yeah, you yeah. by any chance. <laughs> yeah, it's been, yeah. Uh, I'm presenting on it today. Yeah, so it's right. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. <laughs> Good. All right. So, uh, yeah, one more. Yeah. Um, your title has to do with disruption. Yeah, right. Can you expand on that? Yes. So I think it's important to note that this is more than just another tool in our toolbox. I, I think this is radically uh, changing uh, how we're doing training. Um, and uh, it doesn't uh, necessarily replace anything else that we're, we're doing, but uh, this can, uh, in this case, uh, eliminate having to do, go into physical, uh, la or a lot of the time spent. In the alternative would have been probably to build out additional physical uh, labs to do the training. Uh, and uh, I think it's going to disrupt a lot of how we are organized as a training department. We, as we talked about here, uh, probably no one here will be able to, certainly not myself, do this on their own. Uh, we need a whole new skill set. Uh, we need 3D designers, game designers uh, to, to do the development. Still going to need all of our skills in this room to come up with overall concept and be the strategist and do the user testing. I still think there's going to be plenty of work for us, but we're going to have to uh, work with a whole new set of people. Uh, it's not, it's going to disrupt the traditional model of one instructional designer being able to do put together a whole course. You have to work as a team, uh, and it's going to be very unconventional backgrounds that are needed. Uh, so it certainly will, I think, disrupt the learning organization. Is there enough workforce in 3D and game development to meet the needs of people who are developing these? So there's not a lot of Unity developers. There's some, something like 7 million Unity developers. Unity is pretty much there. It powers like 90% of all VR. Some, something like 7 million Unity developers out there. Now, most of them are going to have more of an entertainment background. So I think that's one of the tricks is to find people who can uh, develop in Unity, but for a serious purpose like this. So that's kind of why my firm has a unique niche in doing that. So. Yeah. Curious. Yesterday, I, I was in a seminar where they were talking about uh, adoption issues mm -hmm. in in various learning organizations for different kinds mm -hmm. of technology. And so, uh, so they went through some of the things. And so I'm I'm a, I use VR myself mm -hmm. every day. At mm -hmm. home. I mean, I love oh wow, it. cool. The, it's, yeah. it's part of my daily yeah. play. Yeah. But when I talk about it, not just with people my age, but even younger people, there seems to be a, a resistance to adopt. And I don't, I'm not even talking about leadership, mm -hmm. who you have to convince them, because you can convince them with a good business case. Mm -hmm. Your data is mm -hmm. really helpful and certainly mm -hmm. can capture that. But when you go, you mentioned Novartis. Mm -hmm. Now that's a pharmaceuticals, high tech. Um, but it's a huge corporation, mm -hmm. so not everybody mm -hmm. is in the lab. Yeah, okay. and and I don't know with other people's experience in their corporations that maybe aren't high tech. What have you found the barriers to the actual learners? Mm -hmm. Are they do do they embrace it? Do they say, "Give me PowerPoint"? What do you? Yeah, no. What we're finding that the learners are loving it. It's usually with decision makers, that's the, the challenge. And that's why I think it's so important to actually get them into it. Because I, I find it it's, can be hard to get them to actually, you almost have to force it upon them. Uh, but once they try it, it has to be experienced to be believed. Uh, once they try it in for a few minutes, they, they can be believers and will get behind it. But no, we never have any problems with the users. Uh, and we've gotten a nausea issue, for instance, has been minimal, resistance, really uh, no resistance at all. and. Uh, I'll, it's actually a great segue. I, I want to uh, turn to my uh, next case study here, which deals with a company that uh, has a very uh, uh, kind of non-gamer user base, which is Walmart. So um, I'm going to do a little demo of this game that we developed for Walmart. And uh, this is a game that's been played by uh, employees in their 60s and 70s and we're getting feedback from them uh, along the lines of I never played a game in my life uh, but this was really fun and engaging we've done a lot of user tests and this is a game that's available actually on the app stores it's the first time we're doing something for a client where they've been bold enough to put it up there so it's called Spark City if you haven't downloaded it yet uh, so put it you can get it on an Android or an iPhone 
And uh, you can, yeah, uh, play it uh, on your own. So I, I'll just point out a few things. So when you log into it, uh, you'll, you get to uh, customize your, uh, your avatar and uh, head to the back room. And a few pointers here for those who, uh, of you who don't, uh, haven't worked in a Walmart before or in retail. Uh, uh, so you start in the back room. It's 7 o'clock in the morning. And uh, you, uh, uh, you have three scores on top here. So uh, that's an inventory score, customer satisfaction, and sales. Uh, and it's 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, the clock is ticking down, you walk up to your manager, ask what to do, uh, he asks you, this is actually a real person who came up with a name for the game, Spark City, so he got rewarded by being, uh, almost 3,000 people uh, had name suggestions and he, he won the competition so he got to be in the game. He tells you to go and scan these uh, 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 boxes and put them on a cart and go to your uh, department. Now, the objective of the game, and so there are little mini assignments here, uh, where there's a discrepancy in this case between what's on the shelf and, uh, turn down the volume here a bit, and uh, what's uh, in the system. And so uh, you have to uh, uh, solve those, uh, those uh, mini assignments. Uh, so um, you, uh, I'm just randomly clicking on something here. If you get it wrong, uh, you get negative feedback, you get it right, there's a confetti rain, happy dance, so this is more of a real game. What you saw in the Novartis was obviously, that was a simulation. This is a simulation, but it is also a game. It has that immediacy of feedback, it's uh, the fun element, uh, and uh, uh, it, uh, there's a level mechanism. So once you're done uh, in the back room, uh, you... Uh, uh, you um, level up to the next level. Now the goal of the game is, uh, and really the learning purpose here, is to do these various tasks in a certain order during the course of the day. So uh, in the, at 7 o'clock in the morning, you're supposed to uh, do your inventory overstock uh, and your cap bin. So you're supposed to do the various tasks in this order. And the learning objective really was that People were kind of freelancing, doing these things in different orders, not getting them done. And so they had this process, they called it the one best way that they wanted to teach everyone how to, to do things in. Uh, once you're done in the back room, you head to the uh, uh, grocery department. Now I'm gonna just uh, to tease you uh, uh, and show you what's gonna happen if you stay with the game. Uh, you're gonna uh, be able to level up, so like any good game, after about two weeks of gameplay, when you hit certain uh, targets, you uh, level up to the next department, which is the uh, lawn and garden department. And in lawn and garden, uh, you have uh, a team here, so now you have to assign team members, so it becomes managerial. And you also, of course, have the 10-foot rule, so try this next time you go to Walmart. Uh, within, if an associate is within 10 feet, they're supposed to stop and ask if they can uh, help you. So uh, as soon as the customer is within 10 feet, oh, lots of customers, lots of uh, greetings here. Um, but you also have to uh, assign your staff here. So the cashier, you have to uh, assign uh, people to, and it requires uh, three uh, spark skill level. Only one person has that. Now you can assign Jill to it, but then you need to train her, and you need to as assign Joe to train. Uh, so isn't this great, a training game that actually involves learning how to train your own employees. <laughs> so, uh, now, so now both, uh, uh, both Joe and Jill here are busy, uh, one training uh, the other which is going to short-term uh, impact your customer satisfaction and sales course, but long-term, of course, you know, there'll be positive benefits. Uh, there are also some, I'll uh, do, uh, I have some cheats here just to show you a few other things. So the, uh, there's a spill, so you click on the spill, uh, and you can either guard the spill and get someone else to clean it up, or get cleaning equipment and do it yourself. Now, if you... Uh, uh, do it yourself, you can also speed it up by that. Uh, if you um, get the cleaning equipment and do it yourself, uh, what do you think is going to happen? Obviously, someone's going to fall. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> so now we have a code white here. So now you have to assist the poor customer who uh, is there. Uh, and uh, there's also, here's one of my favorite here. I'll uh, force it up here. Uh, there's a uh, there's, there's shoplifting scenario. So uh, this uh, evil-looking lady here uh, is, uh, 
is a suspected shoplifter. And the strategy at Walmart for shoplifting is aggressive hospitality. <laughs> uh, so you get in their face and say, hey, lady, that thing you just put in your purse, is there something I can help you with about that? Uh, so I love that. That's become a euphemism at our office here whenever we have issues with our clients to <laughs> practice aggressive hospitality with our client. <laughs> so uh, let's see, where is our shoplifter? Oh, there she is. Okay, so you have to click on her, run over there, and practice. <laughs> I've been in this Walmart. <laughs> 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 so nice work. Um, so uh, you did a good job there of uh, aggressive hospitality. So happy dance, confetti rain, more score. Uh, it impacts your sales scores if you do that. So at the end of the day, that's a summary of how you, uh, so you perform. Person game where I could have not yet. Oh. We would love to, yeah. Obviously, uh, yeah, inspired by Fortnite and other multiplayer games that are popular now. It could certainly be turned into a multiplayer, but right now it's single. So all the other characters are uh, are AI driven. Kind of yeah. Interesting. We were thinking like for new employee orientation. Yes. All the new employees could be in. Yeah, the right. Yeah. And that's, uh, this is uh, intended for department managers, but obviously it's up, out there in the public, so anyone uh, uh, looking for a Walmart job, even a recruit, could uh, uh, do it. And they've been talking about, for high scorers, uh, adding a recruitment link uh, for it. So it could be both recruitment and general onboarding. And we have actually, we're working on uh, assistant store manager. We have a, already a store manager and district manager level on this, so you can work your way out, all the way up to uh, to see your sort of whole career. Yeah. I was in retail for 20 years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is awesome. Yeah, like, thank we didn't you. have anything like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I have a question. So, yeah. is there like a, a counter for the back end, like if a, a new associate mm -hmm. completes the training, mm -hmm. does it get reported back to Walmart? Uh, so right now we don't, uh, but we, we have all the hooks, so we, we can certainly set up uh, tracking very easily. But right now it's uh, just locally just for the player. Play yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. And hopefully they do their job better and the person doesn't die. Right, yeah. Well, so the way it's rolled out is actually as part of a one week uh, in class training. So they play it on iPads for half an hour a day. And I'll get to some of the results. Uh, we're actually. Uh, have measured, class. yeah, in the class, and then we have discussions around it. But it was so p the feedback we got was such that, oh, I'll play this on my lunch break or at home, and so we made it public for anyone to play. It is actually very sticky. Try this on your way, on your flight home, and uh, it'll, uh, you'll actually get drawn into it. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Can I just ask? Mm -hmm. So this is in the public domain, and mm -hmm. it was explained to me yesterday about, you know, if you put an app out there, it has to be on the app store so everybody can see it. But I know that I've gone into certain uh, corporate apps and I need to log in using my corporate ID. Is there a reason why Walmart decided let's just leave it open so anybody can play? Yeah, they wanted to, uh, they figured that there wasn't really any uh, proprietary information here and they wanted to make it available for anyone to play on their own device. So and they just want shoplifters could realize that. <laughs> yeah, right, that too. <laughs> <laughs> and for <laughs> recruitment purpose yeah, uh, too. Uh, yeah, but it's, no, certainly there are other ways to distribute a mobile app. You can, uh, most companies these days have internal mechanism to uh, do it just to their own employees. That's how we, almost all our other clients operate, yeah. I think you kind of addressed how, um, what you answered her question mm -hmm. about how then Walmart assesses learning through this. Mm -hmm. uh, I, my question actually goes back to the Novartis mm -hmm. because it's yeah. a different type of uh, experience, this one versus the VR, so mm -hmm. how do they assess learning the managers or the, the leadership at Novart is using the, the a VR um, training module versus this. That at least you have scores that you can see. Right. So yeah. How do you report right. So in the Novartis. Right, yeah. Real so in the Novartis one, you saw the uh, the video there uh, and the feedback. If you don't get it right, you have to redo it. So you just have to keep doing it until you get it every step right. And once you've gone through the whole process, then you start all over. And then they don't stop you. Uh, the system lets you do all the, all of the steps. Uh, and uh, at the end, there's a feedback on how you uh, performed. And you have to uh, get and a certain score. Yeah. 
supervisor. Right. Yeah. Right. And then the supervisor says you're ready to go do it. In yeah. Field. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And we're working on integrating it with learning management system and all that. All that's really easy with any of these. It can be integrated to your legacy learning management. Well, yeah. Actually, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Because that's one one concern was using. Can it be con SCORM compliant? Can it send something to an LMS? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the rest of our modules, it can be reported on. Yeah, on whether right. Completed it. So I was wondering if you guys had success with that or prototyped anything like that. Yeah, yeah. We do that. Almost all everything we do is integrated with learning management system. So obviously, it's uh, it doesn't have a SCORM wrapper because it's an app, so we have right. to use an API. So if you do, uh, but uh, yeah, it can be easily integrated with uh, learning management Thank system. You. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, feel free to play around with that uh, on your own. I'll quickly do. Um, oh. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. It's true. That's a Twenty years. We talk to him. So, uh, so yeah, this is obviously tying into a, a gaming culture. Uh, uh, if you drop your business card, I'll point you to this research that I think is the, the best, like uh, it's a meta study, a study of studies that show that game-based approaches work better than traditional approaches. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, show you here. So in this game, you can actually, if you play long enough, you level up to the lawn and garden level, to, where each new level is a new department and there are new tasks. Uh, so this is like any good le uh, uh, game, it levels up. Uh, you get you have more security issues and entertainment uh, at apparel there's some business acumen skills you have to put things on sales in certain season in ba uh, bakery there are more management tasks the customer service tasks you're adding tasks make it more and more complex as you level up which is just good learning theory right uh, and as far as how this is rolled out again it's in in class uh, half an hour a day for a one week program which actually works real well and then you reflect over the experience you have com conversations about it but then it's also publicly available and here are some of the results so far it's, be, it's all still early days but on the net promoter score of how likely are you to recommend playing it we got 9.6 so it was like off this, the charge uh, classes that we roll this out with compared to classes that didn't play the game uh, had a 22% improvement between the pre and post assessment so uh, that's how we measure the effectiveness and it's already has 300,000 downloads on the App Store without any real marketing or anything really just word of mouth and how long did it take you guys to develop so we had the first level, what you are seeing now, done in about three months, but we've been working now for over a year of doing all these d additional levels, so it's been a very ambitious. But this is like, if you go all the way up, it's like six levels, six departments, it's like six hours of gameplay about, uh, so, um, and that's taken us over a year to develop. So, uh, yes? Yeah, uh, so uh, uh, it's a, a meta study, a study of studies uh, of game-based approaches uh, compared to more traditional approaches. And it shows that regardless if you look at retention rate, fractional knowledge, skill-based knowledge, self-efficacy, uh, that game-based approaches work better than traditional. Uh, it's a professor, uh, uh, Jessica Saltzer, uh, at University of Colorado. But yeah, if you drop your card here, I'll send you the study. And... Uh, yeah, one last question. Yeah. Just one last yeah. question on the slide where you showed that the people, uh, Walmart employees who played the game mm -hmm. improved 22% from their pre-assessment to after. Right, yeah. Do you have a comparison as compared to other people who took the same training but in a traditional? Right, so that is compared to a group that did just the traditional uh, instructor training for a week okay. and a group that did the traditional but played the game for half an hour a day yeah. and had a discussion, yeah. All right, did everyone who wants to participate in the drawing for the, the go? Get a drop there. Anyone else? Any last, last minute request? All right. <laughs>
Drum roll, okay. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Paula Kelly. Oh, that's me. Yay! <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll be around today. Uh, I have another session at the end of the day in the red track. It's really just a repeat of this, but if you want to send other people to it, feel, please do so. And feel free to catch me. I love to continue the conversation. If you left me a business card, I'll follow up with a presentation here and love to hear what you guys are doing here in this space. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. So, because uh, I need to get ready here, but you can yes. try it on uh, on the Quest. Yeah, I right. Just yeah. the Quest as well. Okay. Yes. Let's do that. I just had a quick question about yeah, the sure. technologies, like the cables and everything that yeah. you use to be able to sh show your phone yeah. on the oh, okay yeah. on the screen. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a special kind of uh, setup here? To oh, to show the show phone on the screen. Sure. I use this thing. Uh, so um, yeah, it works really well.